before I speak to an audience, I'd like to uh, say a word about my own biases. I think it's important so that I'm not misunderstood. First, I approach this topic put to me as a political scientist, which I presume means that I approach phenomena with the uh, detached objectivity and the surgical analytical skill of a uh, neutral observer, okay? But I also approach this task as was just uh, uh, told you as the founding member and past chair of the African Security Sector Network, which is a think tank, a pan-African think tank and a civil society organization that the purpose of which was to meet the security challenges of the African continent. That means I am a stakeholder in anything that concerns uh, African security. Finally, last but not necessarily least, I also approach this topic as an avowed militant for uh, the help that Africa needs. Africa, its people and its states to break free of centuries of, again, an unforgiving international system that has exploited and repressed the continent. So that means that I approach this topic also with an African-centered frame of reference. Now, these are the three hats that I must wear that force me not to approach the task superficially, but to submit the topic to a rigorous analysis that goes beyond just uh, describing uh, uh, the uh, challenges and describing the responses. Now, that being said, this is a topic that is quite complex, and uh, General Ndoye just gave us an inkling of that, and I see myself as completing him in his brilliant uh, expose. That means not all aspects, even sometimes the most crucial in the eyes of many, will be covered given the time allocated to me. Now, those things out of the way and being said, let's move on then to talk about the United Nations responses to security challenges in Africa. Now, how I will proceed to tackle it. First, I will speak about the very notion of quote, Africa's security challenges, which of course that phrase deserves to be unpacked, to be interrogated. Then I will focus on quote, UN responses, which I will point out must certainly go beyond uh, what is typically, what typically comes to mind that is uh, peacekeeping operations and stabilization operations. The UN engaged in, in Africa as uh, I think uh, General uh, Ndoye reminded us in other ways, one particular way that I would emphasize that I was involved in. So as I talk about all of these, I will try to make sure that I address the gender and youth dimensions of the security challenges, as well as the nexus between security, peace, and justice, and other aspects of security challenges, particularly because of the audience, because of the topic, the role that security sector leaders that most in the audience are will be tasked with and other dimensions of conflict prevention. Recently, I read an article by two colleagues titled, Why the United Nations Still Matters. And the subtitle is Great Power Competition makes it more relevant, not less. Now, there is, of course, much to be unpacked there, but we have to move on quickly. So the article analyzes the United Nations peacekeeping and concludes very much in what I would call the Council on Foreign Relations mode, among other nuggets that, and I quote, all else being equal, they, they here being UN peacekeepers, are saving lives and preventing the spread of violence. 
Now, I don't think many people will quarrel with this particular conclusion. It is absolutely true, and uh, uh, General uh, Ndoy reminded us of that the UN really does a pretty good job in doing just that, preventing conflict from expanding, certainly, and uh, doing other security enhancing tasks. Despite the criticism that also are leveled at the United Nations peace operations, in particular, the violence that we have seen uh, element of, of, of which uh, in uh, the DRC recently, and also in, uh, in Mali uh, to a lesser extent. And of course, these operations come also with violations uh, such as, uh, uh, again, uh, uh, sexual misconduct and other uh, uh, behavior that violate and breach the UN regulation themselves. But these criticisms are indeed level. Now, the United Nations Security, uh, United Nations uh, Charter does make it the raison d'etre of the United Nations to guarantee, to actually work toward peace and security throughout the world. There is no doubt that African states have had more than their share of security woes. Now, that is due in large part, not entirely, as I will see in a moment, due to Again, the effect of colonization, which out of which came these states, the collapse of colonial empires and all that brought to the continent, but also to the ravages of the Cold War. And I'll say a word about that in a moment. But even after the Cold War, decisions that were made in the international security architecture centered around the Security Council of the United Nations, in which Africans, their states, had very little, if anything, to say. When one takes a look at the ongoing, multi-generations, one might say, crisis in Somalia, it is evident that it is the result, the direct result of great power rivalries in the Horn of Africa, and again, the mismanagement of the crisis for many, many years. Much more recently, all the mayhem that we see in the Sahel can be directly traced to the UN Security Council decision on Libya, spearheaded by prominent NATO members at the instigation of a French president for what appears to be personal political interest. Now, these security woes that the continent was settled with prompted the United Nations to, again, engage on the continent more than in any other part of the world. And that was even before the R2P, that is, the responsibility to protect, that was instituted in 2005. Of course, I evoked the 1960 UN intervention in the Congo, the consequences of which we still live. Of course, the United Nations under its article, under the chapter seven of its charter, was very much involved in crisis management on the continent. Yes, Africa kept the UN very busy with the sheer numbers, frequency, and intensity of the security crisis that it had felt it has felt particularly over the last two decades. So, and this is a key point: when we reflect on Africa's security challenges, we should not pretend to ignore that there were security challenges that were brought on the continent by decisions that were made by others without consulting it, without having its input. Again, many of the crises on the continent that are unfolding right now can 
betrays some decisions, sometimes in Security Council, that the Africans have little to say about. Now, let me make clear something. This is not, repeat, not to hold innocent Africa's leaders, deeds and misdeeds, commissions and omissions, and many societal and structural factors that generate or exacerbate crises and conflicts, including, of course, of course, the wholly dysfunctional security sector in many an African state. I will come to that a little bit later. Now, let me illustrate the points I just made with a crisis that is upon us as we speak, that is the Sudan crisis. It is quite evident that despite some other structural and societal uh, factors, that the main source of the conflict, of the major crisis that again uh, is making victims as we speak, is the dysfunctional nature, functioning and structure of the security sector. We have regular army of a state with a structure called the Rapid Response Force. Clearly that was not workable in any universe and could not be durable without generating conflict. And here we have it. But also part of this crisis is again the unresolved security and justice and development issues that Sudan exhibits every day. So Sudan, but also all the crises, Mali can be cited. You have dysfunctional security systems. You have state failing to let access to natural resources of all, for all communities on an equal basis. You have states that fail to provide justice in any meaningful way to the citizenry. So that is part of analyzing these conflicts and how they have become intractable despite the best effort of the UN. Because often peacekeeping operations, stabilization forces are brought in without resolving the underlying issues the violence that was that is brought on societies, sometimes genocidal behavior, without mentioning the thousands of uh, 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 rapes and uh, 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 sexual abuse of women and girls. These are conflict generating factors that peacekeeping by itself and even the goodwill of the UN, despite all the criticism, cannot resolve on their own. But some of these dysfunctions in the peacekeeping operations are also responsible for the frustrations of many an African state. And we've seen that in the DRC with uh, a request for MONUSCO to leave. But of course, as you know, just uh, last week with the, uh, the Malian authorities asking for uh, MINUSMA to be shut down. Some have argued that, well, why, one might not agree with this uh, conclusion, that the only thing that UN operations succeed in doing is to self-perpetuate. But clearly, whether this criticism is founded or not, the end result is that these frustrations leave, lead states not only to question the very effectiveness of UN interventions, but even to question the motives of those behind the interventions. Now, let me shift gears quickly before time runs out to talk about uh, 
one dimension of UN intervention in African security challenges that to me is quite important, not much talked about uh, in contrast to the uh, uh, peacekeeping and uh, stabilization operations that are larger in scale and more visible. And that is the role that the United Nations, particularly its SSR unit, played in the middle of uh, the uh, 2000, uh, 2000s, particularly in 2009, when again a concerted effort of the United Nations uh, SSR uh, unit. And again, I'm talking about this uh, with some authority because I was involved in this, really played a major role in what became the African Union security sector reform policy framework. Again, the creation of norms that addressed a key ingredient in security challenges and conflicts on the continent, that is the dysfunction and the need for their reform or their trans transformation of Africa's security apparatuses. And again, I just spoke about just uh, one example in uh, Sudan as a factor that generates conflict. Again, the UN here, through steady work of its uh, 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 operatives, arrive at the policy framework that the, the African Union did adopt and uh, regional organizations such as ECOWAS emulated and went even further. It is absolutely critical that the norms and expectations that are created by this type of activities and capacity building that followed on the part of the UN did make an important impact, in my view, in certainly the expectations and the focus on the dysfunctions of security sector uh, in African countries as conflict and crisis generators and the need to address them promptly. And again, one only needs to look at uh, uh, Sudan to, uh, uh, to, to see that that dysfunction and the lack of attention to it really can generate conflict. One, one might argue that actually one of the reasons uh, the conflict really uh, just burst to the open is when uh, the uh, security sector reform of uh, uh, Sudanese armed forces was started to come in uh, full gear. Now, let me also emphasize that this does not mean that just creating those norms is enough. Indeed, ECOWAS has gone even beyond what the AU members uh, uh, agreed on. That did not prevent again the huge crisis that uh, the, this region uh, does contend with uh, right now. Let me also switch gears, but barely. Given the numerous, the numerous security challenges they face and their dependence on the UN system and the good graces of their rich partners in the West. African leaders have always clamored for new approaches to the long-standing security crisis that they are facing by putting forth the concept of African solutions for African problems with the rest of the world standing in solidarity with the African continent, but deferring to Africans themselves in terms of analyzing their security challenges and the solutions to be brought to them. And certainly moving away from the cookie cutting approaches that clearly seem to have failed. And this request is in the spirit of chapter eight of the UN Charter on Regional Arrangement. Let me quote Secretary General Antonio Guterres at the 36th AU summit. He said, quote, I wholeheartedly support the creation of a new generation of robust peace enforcement missions and counter-terrorist operations led by the African Union with the Security Council mandate under Chapter 7 and with, guarant with guaranteed predictable funding, including through assessed contributions 
end of quotation. Now, that is a major stance on the part of uh, Secretary General Guterres, and it is particularly relevant to West Africa and the Sahel and their distinctive security challenges. Now, time, time is running out, so let me conclude. And let me echo what I certainly heard in General uh, Ndoi's presentation. He didn't say this, I am saying this. Despite its congenital flaws, as the design in intent and institutional structure of imperial powers and World War II victors to ensure their own security first and to reduce the likelihood of a catastrophic war among themselves, to whom Africa and its people were truly irrelevant, it is out of question and this is where, again, I meet uh, uh, General Ndoy. It is out of question to throw the UN baby with the bathwater as the saving goes. In other words, the UN remains very much useful to the world and to Africa, singularly if the continent does not get its act together to face its own demons. Now, how? does the African continent face its own security demons? Allow me to evoke an article I wrote some 20 years ago. Now, I doubt that anybody in this audience has read that article or even heard of it. Uh, that was 20 years ago, and uh, absolutely nobody knew about me. And here's the title. The title is, quote, beyond the organization of African unity slash Berlin conference framework, a pan-Africanist analysis of Africa's security crisis. That was again 20 years ago. I had written that article following another one in the op-ed mode that I also presented to the All African Student Conference. That early article was titled and that was in 1989, right after the, whole, the fall of the Berlin Walls, the actual Berlin Walls falling. I wrote the title of this article, The Berlin Walls Nobody Talks About. And of course, I was referring to the uh, colonial borders and to the attendant national sovereignty fetishism, as I call it, that prevented African countries to collectively face their security woes and to bring to them Africa solutions. So in that article, I proffered a number of recommendations. Now, I am sure that at the time, not very many people read that article, but I am quite happy that the African security architecture that later came, the African common defense that later came, even the regional standby forces reflect some of the recommendations that I put then earlier, because even 20 years ago, one could see that insecurity and the challenge of ensuring security would be in Africa's future. Now, even these structural and institutional solutions that Africa brought fall short of addressing, again, what I call the national sovereignty fetishism that still characterizes the African continent and prevents it from truly putting in place solutions that will render it less dependent on the United Nations, if it can, and less dependent on the goodwill of its external partners. And again, Security is critical. If the continent cannot wrap its mind, its, its head around how to bring African solutions to African problems, I don't think it can blame the UN for failing in, by and large, by and large, to eradicate the security wars that the continent faces. Now,